Hey fellas, we're in the thick of winter and the storms are brewing. It looks like one to three inches are in the forecast when you trim that hibernation bush that's taking place in your pants. Luckily, our partners at Manscaped specialize in products to make sure you're walking around town with beautiful snowballs. Manscaped is here to provide the best tools for your grooming experience, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. The Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer is the best hygiene tool for the modern man. I use it. I've never cut myself like I did with scissors one time when I will never forget. Because of the ceramic blade and their advanced skin safe technology, your snags and your snowballs will be reduced. The trimmer is also waterproof, so if you trim in the shower or jacuzzi or sauna or whatever, it's not a big deal. And Manscaped's performance package is the best buy of 2021. What does the performance package include, you ask me? Well, hold on, I'm gonna tell ya. The performance package comes with the Lawnmower 3.0, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, a performance boxer brace, which I actually really love, and a travel bag, which is really convenient. You might as well have the best tools for the job. This bundle also comes with the Crop Preserver, which is ball deodorant, and Crop Reviver, which is ball toner. Uh, the Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant that'll make your balls smell nice and make you feel like your testes are walking on a winter wonderland. They also have a ton of other amazing men's hygiene products on their website from disposable mats for your pubes to foot deodorant. My feet stink a lot, maybe I'm gonna go order some of that. So go ahead and get 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com by using the code GAS20. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and don't forget to use the code GAS20. That's Manscaped for making our winter wieners look so good. <laughs> In 2017, Austrian Formula One legend Niki Lauda claimed in an interview that he had no friends. Two years later, he died at the age of 70 of kidney failure and the tributes poured in. Lewis Hamilton wrote, quote, I will miss our conversations, our laughs, the big hugs after winning races together. Love you, man. His ex-wife Marlena, note the ex, said of Niki that during his racing career, he was, quote, the biggest asshole in the world. When confronted with her words, Nikki agreed, saying, quote, she was completely correct. On the track, British playboy James Hunt was famously Nikki's greatest rival, dramatized in the Ron Howard film, Rush. Their teams, McLaren and Ferrari, openly loathed each other. And yet, the two drivers had shared an apartment during their Formula 3 days. While Nikki refused to call anyone his friend, including James, he also said James was, quote, someone he'd have a beer with. What else can you call that but a friend? On race day, Niki Lauda was known as a steely-eyed Austrian with a killer mindset. Perhaps it's no coincidence that his most famous compatriot is known around the world as the Terminator. Yet Niki's most famous moment was a horrific crash at the Nürburgring that left him permanently scarred, showing that he was not a Terminator at all. He was flesh and bone just like everyone else. Widely considered to be the first truly technical driver in F1, Nikki's greatest moment was not a lap time or a racing win, it was his choice to return to racing weeks after his accident, a moment of pure heart. There's an impulse in life to put people and their personalities into neat boxes, to categorize them as likable or unlikable, brave or cowardly, heroes or villains. How did Nikki Lauda defy those categories? What about the showdown in Nikki's own body between his head and his heart? His logic and his life force. A man of steel and a man of blood and flesh. Today on Pass Gas, it's Nikki Lauda and the contradictions that made him human. Pass Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. That's a fire intro. Great intro, everyone. All right. Good job out there, everybody. Good job, Nolan. Great job. Uh, welcome to Pass Gas. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co-hosts, James Pumphrey. What's up, Pass Gas guys? And Joe Weber. <laughs> uh, what's up, Wink Wink Nation? I'm here for you guys. <laughs> I don't want to do the other one because uh, uh, out of respect for Nikki Lauda and, and the thing that he went through. Well, it's very courteous of you, Joe. Uh, good thinking. Uh, yeah, today we're talking about uh, one of my favorite drivers, I would say, uh, Nicky Lauda. Uh, he sadly passed away in 2019 uh, at the age of 70 years old, very young, too soon. Um, and now we think it, it, it's finally time for us to cover his story on the show. Uh, I, I think we've got a very, uh, it, it'll be a jam-packed episode for you guys. 
Um, he lived a very incredible life and just one of those unique personalities that stood out in Formula yeah. One. I'm going to be honest. I don't know too much about his life other than what I saw in Rush. Mm -hmm. But I will say that the actor who played Nicky Lauda seemed like he was doing a gold member impression. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Brühl. Yeah, great actor. it came off as a little gold member -y. I do want to watch a couple interviews with Nicky Lauda and see if he was similar to gold member or if he was not like gold member at all. He eats skin from a hey, little box. I don't think he ate skin flakes from a little box. If like he gold smokes member. while he's eating, that's that's a weird joke to have in kind of a kid's movie, like the smoking while you're eating thing. You know, like smoking a pancake and uh, bong in a blintz and all that stuff. I haven't seen gold member <laughs> in maybe 15 years at this point. So yeah. I don't remember. I do remember smoking a pancake. Yeah. Um, do you think Austin Powers is a kid's movie? There's Excuse lots of words. duty in it. Remember that duty in the coffee yeah. mug thing? That was gross. That was really gross. It's a bit nutty. Like it's very like juvenile. It's not for kids, but it's for 15 year old boys. I certainly did enjoy it as a 15 year old boy. That's that's for sure. And I'm, uh, I'm I'll go on record saying Goldmember, the third Austin Powers movie, is the best Austin Powers movie. The one with Beyonce. Yeah. Huh. Fight me in the comments. I don't care. I have nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Literally nothing to lose in this nothing argument. Nothing to lose. <laughs> I'm happy to be here with you guys talking. It's always a, a good day on past yeah. gas. Well, now I'm fired up. Can we get back into this? <laughs> Let's get back into it. How? Uh, I think we're ready to get into the story of one Nikki Lauda. Yes, let's do it. Yeah, Absolutely. let's get into it. Let's tell this tragic tale. Let's go. It's not, it's not, it's, I would say it's inspirational. I wouldn't say it's tragic. He, yeah, he, it's inspirational. Half full. Yeah, he lived a very uh, full life, I would say. Yeah, and he didn't let this like incident keep him down. Like He bounced back so quickly. Yeah, as we'll see. As we'll see. He had a very uh, interesting attitude about it that I think we can all... Uh, learn from let's go let's go let's go born in 1949 nikki lauda grew up an austrian version of richie rich which in german makes him oh, reiki reich <laughs> that doesn't sound correct <laughs> no that's 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 incorrect <laughs> all right oh my god <laughs> he came from a line of Viennese industrialists that were as well connected as it gets in Europe. His great grandfather Ernst, for example, had been knighted by Austrian Emperor Franz Josef in 1916. I, my great grandfather definitely was not knighted, so we are positively in different tax brackets. Um, I'm related to Joe Biden, so he's <laughs> he's our king now. So you guys hey, better you guys better shape up and start showing me some freaking respect because <laughs> my distant cousin Joe is now the king. Uh, isn't it crazy that the president has my name? Yeah, dude. So Nolan looks like you're odd man out. You better show us some respect. Show us some respect. Respect your elders, all right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> sure thing. You got it, guys. <laughs> As you do when your family has massive tracts of private land where you can do whatever you want, Nikki learned to drive at age 10 when a cousin would take him out in a small car. Austria's driving age was 18, so it wasn't until Nikki was 19 that he got his first car, a Mini Cooper S. Great first car, if you ask Great me. Great first car. Which he would always recall as his favorite car ever. High praise from Nikki Lauda. Eventually, he started racing the Mini in hill climbs around Austria until eventually upgrading to a Porsche 911. He proved to be a natural, winning nearly every hill climb he entered. That's awesome. If you think about it, 911's just the backwards uh, Mini Cooper S. Rear engine, rear wheel drive versus front engine, front wheel drive. That's what people call them. Oh, yeah. 911? That's a backwards <laughs> Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki's yeah. family, however, uh, they were against him racing. They wanted him to go into the family business, which was banking. 
Nikki's grandfather, the patriarch of the family, was particularly dead set against Nikki racing. In Nikki's words, they would quote, all have preferred to see my name in the business section of the newspaper instead of the sports pages. Uh, but Wait, encourage- that's a quote. You can't, you can't add but something. I know, but he said that in another interview that I watched. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, <laughs> you, Joe. Hey, no, no, show some respect! Like, I, <laughs> it just seemed like you were adding words to his quote. <laughs> yeah, you're right. See, I, did, I, watched, I watched some interviews this morning, all right? So, I've got, okay. I've got the okay. knowledge. I trust you. But encouraged by a supportive relative by the name of Uncle Heinz, Nikki <laughs> stuck with his racing dream. Please call me Beans. <laughs> Don't listen to your parents, Nikki. You must race. <laughs> listen to me, Uncle Beans. <laughs> and you know what? We sincerely hope that everyone listening has an Uncle Heinz in their life. Everybody needs something like that that's going to push them to do what they want in their life, you know? I believe like, I'm your Uncle Heinz. A little yeah, bit. You're knowing. my Uncle Beans? Yeah, I'm your Uncle Beans, buddy. <laughs> So with his grandpa like being so against it, um, Nikki like used that as motivation to be better. He's like, okay, if my stubborn old grandpa is gonna be so against me, they had a big blowout fight where Nikki said, No, I'm not gonna do the freaking banking. All right, I'm gonna race. The only numbers I care about are lap times and horsepower numbers, gramps. That's right, baby. So he used that as like motivation. He's like, Well, I'm essentially like the black sheep of the family, I better be as good as I possibly can to prove them wrong. Did they cut him off financially? You know, I'm not sure. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, it takes a lot of money to do F1. With Uncle Beans' support, uh, <laughs> wind now blowing at his back, Nicky got his Formula Racing start in Formula V, otherwise known as Formula Volkswagen. If you're not familiar, Formula V was a class of racing that was popular in Central Europe at the time, with a wedge-shaped, snub-nosed car with protruding tires based on the pre-1973 Volkswagen Beetle, minus the distinctive Beetle shape. The cars topped out at 120 miles per hour and came in consumer kits that were relatively affordable for race cars. You can still actually do Formula V. It's still very popular. It's like the, lo it's the lowest rung of that. open wheel. I want to do I that. I would love to do that. Yeah. Bet I wouldn't fit in the car. Nikki performed well, and soon he had outgrown Formula V, huh? Much like James would. <laughs> <laughs> the next step was Formula 2, but he needed cash to get a shot. Formula 2 was much more expensive. With his silver spoon firmly in place, Nikki got what he needed in 1971. With the help of his family connections, at the age of 22, he secured a 3,000-pound bank loan. That's cool $600,000 in today's money. Pretty wow. easy to get banks to work with you when your parents own a bank. your family's in the banking business yeah yeah the cash bought him a spot on the march team for the 1972 season march was a newer team founded in 1969 nice by max mosley alan reese graham coker and ramid hurt together their names spelled march hmm. ah. unfortunately much like an ill-fated garage band the naming of the team was about as much of a high point as they would experience while the team experienced success in producing F2 and F3 cars, they simply didn't have the budget for the elite engineering required for F1. Although Lauda proved himself on the team and was quickly racing their F1 cars in addition to F2, it was a frustrating season for everyone involved. The issue was March's 1972 F1 car. It was an experimental design with a transverse gearbox, meaning the engine's axis was perpendicular to the car. The experiment was a failure. It was, as Nikki put it quite plainly, undrivable. One bright spot was Lauda's teammate, Swedish driver Ronnie Peterson, who was a few years older than Nikki and helped show the younger Austrian driver the ropes. Now, although they got along, they were opposites on the track. Nikki was already becoming a technical driver, while Ronnie was much more instinctual. The only downside for Nikki was the clear hierarchy on the team. He was forbidden from passing Ronnie during a race. The rule ended up not mattering too much as the season was a bust for both drivers, with Nikki's best finish a seventh place in South Africa and Ronnie Peterson only making the podium a single time for a third place in Germany. So I just wanted to add, um, 
when when Nikki transitioned from Formula Three and Formula Two and made the jump to Formula One, he actually had a bank sponsorship lined up with the bank that had given him the loan. Um, they were going to just give him money this time around and have the bank on the car for more exposure throughout Europe. You know, that's the whole point of sponsorships. But his stubborn old grandpa oh actually God. stepped Beans. in. Not, no, no, no. That's Uncle Beans. Uncle Beans is cool. Uncle Heinz is cool. Uncle Beans, go beat up grandpa. But grandpa came in. He heard that the bank was going to sponsor him. And at this point, he's still, he's still against Nikki Racing. He steps in and says, no, you're not going to sponsor my grandson because I don't. he needs to be in my family business. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to let him race. So they actually called off the sponsorship, and Nikki had to go get another loan instead of getting it for free. Can you imagine being so rich that your grandson being a professional athlete is embarrassing? <laughs> like, yeah, that's crazy. Uh... By 1973, Lauda's loan was spent, and so was his relationship with March. Ronnie Peterson left for Lotus, but the best Lauda could manage was a spot on British Racing Motors, or BRM. BRM had been a great team for the past decade, winning four Constructors' Cups, but by 73, the team was unable to keep up with the new emerging elites of F1, namely Lotus, Tyrell, McLaren, and Ferrari. Although Nicky didn't have to pay for his spot on BRM, Lewis Stanley, BRM's stern British leader, wasn't paying for Nikki to drive either. In Nikki's words, if I did a good qualifying run, he'd give me an apple. But that was it. What? That's like well, yeah, that's how you pay horses. <laughs> 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 Nikki had another disappointing season, struggling with BRM's subpar car. Uh, I wonder if he was being like hyperbolic or if like literally the guy would give him an apple. And probably hyperbolic, <laughs> probably joking. Nikki's a funny guy. Yeah. Uh, still, Nikki's performance on the track was starting to make people take notice. At the 1973 edition of Monaco, Lauda qualified in a respectable sixth, driving a car the whole field knew to be inferior. During the race, he performed even better, scrapping his way up to third before gearbox failure ended his day. Among those taking notice was a little guy named Enzo Fanati. The typical meetings behind closed doors took place, and for his third F1 season, Lauda got his dream job. He was invited to race for the grand horsey of them all, Scuderia Ferrari. Nicky had no qualms leaving BRM because he only got paid in apples and not much else. <laughs> even, even his performance at Monaco seemed to have no impact. Still, no money, just apples on apples. Can, so I'm having a hard time visualizing an instinctual driver versus a technical driver. Nolan, can you explain this to me? You know, uh, I would think that like an, an instinctual driver it, in that time meant that someone just had really great car control and they were just able to like just keep the car on track. Just that natural mm -hmm. talent of knowing what the car is going to do and being able, to, being able to correct. And then a technical driver would probably be someone who's doesn't have that raw natural talent of the car control. Of course they got to have it, but like they're probably also really like thinking about, you know, take like looking at track maps, mapping out exactly where they're going to apex and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Instinctual is like less focused on shaving tenths off by like correcting something. And it's like Pro Prost versus Senna. Yes. And yeah. like at this time, I think Nikki was one of those guys that was like, he's obviously silver spoon kind of dude who could just like not buy his way in, but the money certainly helped him get into the sport. But he did have that talent to back it up. At this time in Formula One, especially in the early years, like there were still just a lot of dudes that were silver spoon, but ne didn't necessarily have that talent, you know, mm -hmm. but they were able to keep the car on track. Yeah, th they weren't necessarily like, and it's still sort of this way, but like, not necessarily the greatest driver in the world, but the greatest rich guy drivers in the world. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Exactly. It's like if a basketball cost $300 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So now Nicky's that Ferrari. He's getting his shot. Thanks to his family's financial support and his true talent for driving, a combination of wealth and skill that has become a predictable pattern when it comes to racing at the highest level. Still, despite his wealth... <laughs> 
Nikki had a relatively simple life, especially at a time when Formula One was known for drivers who partied like rock stars off the track. Nikki was an introvert in a sport that was at the time largely defined by its extroverts and larger than life personalities. That's a good point. I feel like I I could not see Lewis Hamilton Instagramming him partying like all night. Like he's just like always like doing something really healthy. Yeah. Training. Max for stopping, like <laughs> would not see him at a club just like no. shouting the I, I ironically the only person I can picture on the grid right now that would be like posting parties on his story would be like someone like Kimi Raikkonen, the oldest driver on the grid. Yeah. You know? So yeah, back to Nikki. Although Ferrari was a big time team with budgets and egos to match, the first half of the seventies had been a rough go for the Regazzi and Red. Their decision to hire the little-known Lauda, who hadn't even come close to an F1 podium, seemed like a pretty odd gamble. But Enzo proved that he knew what he was doing. At 78 years old, Ferrari was still a fearsome patriarch who demanded excellence from his team. In Nicky's debut at the Argentina Grand Prix, Lauda immediately lived up to Enzo's expectations, placing second behind only Denny Hume of McLaren. It was an immediate breakthrough that showed Nikki had finally, truly arrived on the F1 scene. But before we go any further, I think we should talk about Nikki's role in developing the Ferrari, helping them go from middling success to uh, getting that second place finish. Joe, in the movie Rush, which you love so yeah. much, there's that famous scene of uh, Nikki test driving the car at the at Marinello. Uh, yeah. What does Nikki say about the Ferrari? He says, uh. Oh my, Alberto! <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> no, what he, he, he says, he, uh, "You know, the mechanic uh, asks him, hey, how's the car feel?'" And he says, "It." <laughs> he tells the mechanic oh, to his okay. face, "The car." <laughs> that um, scene. Yeah, I thought you're talking about the scene where he is saying, "Oh boy, Alberto!" <laughs> That's a different one. Um, and, according to an interview uh, that uh, Nikki Lauda gave, I can't remember with who. Uh, it was actually. Ferrari's son Dino that had asked him what he thought of the car um, and that's that's a you know blasphemy at Ferrari you yeah. never talk good about the car you get a freaking uh ruler to the wrist for that yeah so Nikki said to Dino hey like this car is shit. uh Enzo Ferrari did not speak English uh but he knew enough and Enzo came over and was like uh what, what does Nikki think about the car and Dino was a little hesitant to say and then Nikki was like, the car is shit. And then Enzo was like, eh, the car is shit. Huh? <laughs> and uh, Nikki Lauda, there was like a long silence. Nikki says that it was like the longest uh, 30 seconds of his life, which in retrospect, like. <laughs> yeah, the guy's had a, some long 30 seconds. Yeah, since. so that means a lot. Um, Ferrari, Enzo actually responded. He's like, okay, why is it shit? And then Nikki explains that the car understeers a lot. Uh, doesn't want to like turn in uh, at speed. Uh, so Enzo asks Nikki, like, how much faster does he think the car could go around, around Marinello if the understeer is fixed? And Nikki says, you know, um, maybe three to five tenths. And then Enzo's like, okay, we'll fix the car. And if you don't go five tenths faster, you're fired. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and Nick is like, oh, <laughs> he's like, uh, in the interview, he's like, ah, I think I made a mistake. Three days go by. The engineers have, like, worked on the car. Nikki takes it out at Marinello once again and goes eight tenths faster. Oh, okay, uh, cool. He <laughs> still got fired, though, because he didn't hit exactly five tenths. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, Joe. Yeah, so he goes eight tenths faster. And uh, Nikki says that uh, after that, that's when Enzo uh, respected him. Uh, Enzo didn't really take a lot of gruff like that, but if someone could back it up and prove him wrong and make the car better, I think rightly so. That deserves some respect. Yeah. Anyway, uh, after the uh, Argentine Grand Prix, three races later, Nikki was driving in the rain and lapped the f entire field to win his first race at the Spanish Grand Prix. Uh, it, was a, it was a bit of redemption, not just for Nikki, but Ferrari, who incredibly hadn't won a race since 1971. Wow. Insane. Uh, the Ferrari was fast, and Lauda was fast, too. And over the course of the season, uh, he 
earned pole position in six of the 15 races. But still, Nicky was adjusting to his third team in as many seasons, and he had a series of retirements that led him to finishing in fourth place for the season at Ferrari. Nicky had proven not only did he deserve the spot at Ferrari, he also deserved to be paid for that spot. This blows my mind that these guys weren't getting paid. I th- Well, again, it's like... It's that same thing when you find out that many, many actors in Hollywood are all parents of like producers or yeah. other successful people. It's like you can afford to do this stuff when you don't have to worry about paying your rent. Yeah. Yeah. Also notable was Nikki's dedication to working with team engineers to incrementally test and improve his cars. Although it seems like a very obvious process now, in those days of Formula One, not all drivers were so dedicated. They, they figured they were there to just show up on race day and drive fast. Nikki put everything he had into his preparation, and it showed. And, Joe, I think that's another aspect of that technical versus instinctual driver. Yeah, just like preparation, uh, studying the course. Understanding like how a car works. Understanding what adjustments on the car uh, do. Yeah. The better a driver is, and this is across all motorsports, the better a driver is at communicating uh, how the car feels around track and even offering suggestions on how to adjust the car to the mechanics, like, yeah, the better. That's a technical driver. That's a technical driver. Anyway, 1975 was the year all the hard work paid off, resulting in what Nikki called his, quote, dream year. Ferrari and Nikki had worked together to tune the Ferrari 312T to near perfection, and the car would remain in use by Ferrari until 1981 eventually becoming the winningest car in F1 history. For his part, Nicky was easily the winningest driver of 1975, triumphing in five of 14 contests. Only one other driver, Emerson Fittipaldi, even managed to win two races. And in the end, Nicky had an insurmountable 20-point lead in the standings. Among his many accomplishments for the year, Nicky became the first ever driver to lap the Nürburgring in less than seven minutes. The triumph foreshadowed how Nikki's racing legacy would forever be shaped by the dauntingly epic German track. The next season in 1976, the Nürburgring would be the setting for one of the most shocking moments in F1 history, not to mention Nikki's own life story. Guys, if you've been opting out of skincare, I understand. I didn't really care about my skin until, I don't know, last year, okay? The truth is, like, most of you care about your skin, you just don't know where to start. If you're looking for something simple that works without being too complicated, then you have to check out this week's sponsor, Curology. Curology makes skincare effortless, okay? They create a custom skincare formula for your skin goals. That could be, you know, clearer skin, less oily skin, less dry skin, the works. Plus, they've got a cleanser and a moisturizer that's super easy on your skin and super easy to use. Don't even have to think about it. Everything ships right to your doors and your first 30 days are free. Just cover the five bucks for shipping and handling. Sign up for Curology in minutes by sharing your skin type and skin goals, and a licensed provider can create a custom formula made for you. That's right. One personalized formula that's all you, okay? Whether you're struggling with acne, like me, I still get zits every week, very annoying at 27 years old, dark spots, or just want something simple and straightforward. They've also got some amazing products you can add to your subscription, like an acne body wash, which I will definitely be taking. Still getting that back, you know what I'm saying? Emergency spot patches, so you can do it up nice or keep it simple. The sign-up process is super simple. Just a few quick questions like, what's your current skincare routine? Do you have any medications? Uh, what is your skin actually like? Upload a few photos so that licensed professional can take care of you. It's very convenient. Takes a lot of the guesswork out of going to the store. I still don't know what face soap I should be using. And it's also super easy to add to even begin a skincare routine. You just apply this stuff at night and it works while you sleep. Very easy for uh, busy people like you and myself. This stuff is great. If you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, do what I did. Go to Curology.com slash gas for a free 30-day trial. You just pay for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash gas to unlock your free 30-day trial. See Curology.com for all the details. Thank you very much, Curology. We're all looking for ways to save money, right? Especially now. So let me ask you this. How'd you like to keep an extra $961 per year in your own pocket? That's how much Gabby customers save per year on average on car and home insurance. This is the time of year we're all shopping for new insurance, right? That's the reason I chose Gabby Insurance when I started shopping for insurance. 
Gabby takes the pain out of shopping for insurance by giving you apples to apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide, Travelers. All you have to do is just link your current insurance account and in just minutes you'll be able to see quotes for the exact same coverage you have. It was super easy. I just logged on. I put my insurance info in there. And within a couple minutes, I was able to see what I could be paying for all these different companies. Gabby helped me find the best rate. Like I mentioned before, on average, Gabby insurance customers save $961 per year. I mean, what do you spend $961 on per year? 180 gram vinyl? What else? Uh, a new Stratocaster? I don't know. It's just nice to have that money in your pocket. And if they can't find you savings like they did for me, they'll let you know so you can relax knowing that you have the best rate. And one thing they'll never do is sell your info, which is, you know, a big deal breaker for me. You are probably overpaying for your car and home insurance. So why not see how much Gabby can save you? It's totally free and there's no obligation to buy anything. So go to Gabby.com slash G-A-S. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash gas. Gabby.com slash gas. Thanks, Gabby. We should mention that 1975, the season we just talked about, Nikki won his first championship. By 20 points. By 20 points. He said that uh, this was his hardest, uh, hardest fought championship, at least at that point, obviously. It was part of Nikki's nature not to be satisfied with a single championship. He was determined to defend his title, make his great grandpa look like a jerk. But more than anything, he was focused <laughs> on outperforming himself. In the off season, he spent a grueling six hours a day running, swimming, and cycling to increase his mental and physical strength. Unheard of conditioning for an F1 driver of the time. I got to get into that so I can be at yeah. the top of my YouTube game, dude. This is like back in the day when people were drinking whiskey and eating steaks for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Enter James Hunt, a devilishly handsome Brit with long blonde hair and a crooked smile. James was incredibly charismatic, known as much for his partying off the track as he was for his performance on it. It was rumored that he had slept with 35 British Airways stewardesses over the course of a single race week. His playboy reputation masked the fact that behind the mop of beautiful blonde hair, cigarettes and the liquor or the babes on his arm was an incredibly fierce competitor 1976 was james's first year with mclaren after a strong performance at hesketh alistair caldwell the manager of mclaren recalled when james sat in the cockpit of the car for the first time even though it wasn't yet turned on the car was vibrating shaking with james's nervous energy on the surface nikki and james couldn't be more different because of Nikki's mullet and overbite combo, Lauda was openly referred to by James and others as Rat. A nickname, like many nicknames, was partially loving, partially insulting. Over the years, it evolved. Many fans referred to Nikki as Super Rat or Rat King. <laughs> the two struck up an unlikely friendship. Nikki didn't threaten James, who valued his looks and could be confident he would always be the prettiest race car driver in the room. Of Nikki, James would say, quote, Although we appear on the outside to be very different people, I get on very well with him. We share the same view of life and the same goals. Of course, the similar goal was to win at F1. For all their camaraderie off the track, both drivers brought enormous egos and competitive spirit to every race. In 1976, McLaren were in many ways the underdog. Ferrari had a longer history and a bigger budget. With that came a bit of arrogance. Alistair Caldwell described the team of the time as incredibly Italian, <laughs> leaving you to fill in the blanks. Of course, that ignored the fact that the team's star driver was not Italian at all, but a serious, laser-focused Austrian known as Niki Lauda. The season started at Interlagos in Brazil, where Lauda got off to a great start securing the win. As the season continued, it wasn't clear there would be any sort of rivalry between Ferrari and McLaren as Lauda performed strongly and got out to a solid lead in points. Ferrari's luck would change in Spain. Before the race, Lauda fell off a tractor at his home and broke several ribs. James saw his opportunity, figuring he'd win the race handedly, and he did. When asked how he accomplished the win, James responded, I got big balls. <laughs> 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 Two of them. They live between my legs. 
shiny eggs. <laughs> Those big balls would retract <laughs> in the post-race review, however, as in a first of Formula One, Hunt's win was disqualified, stunning the race crews and the public. Apparently, it had been ruled that McLaren's car was a centimeter, that is 0.39 inches too wide. It was a shady ruling that foreshadowed FIA's infamous favoritism of Alan Prost over Ayrton Senna a decade later. Alistair Caldwell of McLaren speculated that since the race judges had inspected the car in advance of the race, they had full knowledge of the grounds for disqualification. Yeah, what the hell? But chose to wait until after the race to disqualify Hunt. Ruling meant that Lauda was now ahead 33-6 to six in points. At the next race, James Hunt showed he wasn't taking it too seriously polishing a bumper sticker affixed to the spoiler of his McLaren that read, Caution, Wide Vehicle. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty funny. Uh, weeks later, the points from the race would be reinstated following a review, but it was clear that James Hunt had no friends in Formula One executive offices. Halfway through the season was the British Grand Prix. Now, at this point, James Hunt was a media phenomenon in his home country, and he brought out a massive sold-out crowds to Brands Hatch. Many in attendance had never before taken an interest in F1. The race was as chaotic as the stands, with Clay Regazzoni, Nicky's Ferrari teammate, accidentally colliding with the rear of Nicky's car, sending them both spinning out in front of a crowded field. James was among the drivers caught up in the mayhem, and his car skipped over a curb and flew into the air. Like the tomcat that he was, he managed to land flat on his wheels, speeding off to the pits. What? Yeah, he dude. did a full flip and landed on his wheels? Man, those are big, shiny, smooth balls. The race was slated for a restart, but it was rumored James's car wouldn't be allowed to join. The British crowd became riled up, chanting, We want James! We want James! We're hooligans! We will throw bottles at you! We love the Queen and we love James! They booted the marshals and tossed beer cans onto the track. McLaren, scrambling to repair James's car in time, benefited from the delay. Nicky was furious that McLaren had bought the extra time. When the restart finally happened, Nicky took off in first, but James was able to tail him closely. About halfway through, he passed, making the crowd go even crazier than they had before. James won the race. It seemed like the season wasn't over after all. <laughs> However, trouble once again lurked after the race. Ferrari and other teams disputed James's win, arguing that since he'd taken a shortcut to the pit before the restart, he hadn't raced the full race distance, and that the marshals had only allowed him to race out of fear of the crowd. No decision was yet made, but the race would come back later in the season to haunt James. Man, there's so much pettiness in F1. It's, it's so just like a misunderstanding. Like, the fans don't want this. Yeah. You understand? Like, at the end of the day... This is entertainment for the people, right? This isn't about you. It's about us, and we don't freaking want this crap. Earlier in the season, the F1 Drivers Union had held a meeting in Long Beach uh, back when they raced at Long Beach, which they should do oh, they, again. Everyone meet at Wahoos. We're going to go <laughs> over the rules for next season. The topic was the increasingly powerful F1 cars that were becoming more and more of a safety concern. Especially worrisome for the drivers was the Nürburgring and whether it could host the new F1 cars safely. The track itself was 23 kilometers long or about 12 miles, meaning counting both sides of the track, there was 46 kilometers of uh, barriers and such to be kept safe and staffed with emergency personnel. That's a lot of area to cover. 140 people had been killed on the track since 1927. Nikki was among those, arguing that it was too dangerous, but by a 3-2 to two vote, he was overruled. Now, the next race after Britain was the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, and Nikki had no choice but to compete. There were bad vibes from the start, okay guys? The Sunday before the race, a fan had come up to Nikki and asked for an autograph. Nikki signed it, thinking nothing of it, but the fan wasn't done. He asked Nikki to put the date next to the autograph. Nikki had never been asked to date his autograph before, and so he asked why. The answer the fan gave him was chilling. Quote, because it could be the last one. That's a <laughs> messed that's up thing to do as a dumb. fan. Even, yeah. even if that's why, you don't tell him. You're yeah. like, I don't know, in case you win. I want to prove that it was today. <laughs> yeah, that's messed up, dude. That guy's a sociopath. Yeah. 
<laughs> in case it's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who is this guy? Willem Dafoe in like Platoon? <laughs> I come for the mayhem. Why are you laughing so much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, what a creep, dude. The race started in rainy conditions. All but one driver, Joachim Mass of McLaren, started on wet tires. I don't know what Joachim was thinking. Uh, as the race got underway, the sun came out, and Joachim actually took the lead because the track was drying up. I guess he got the call right. That's what he was thinking. That, that's what he was thinking, Nolan. Uh, it was clear the other drivers would have to switch to have a chance at catching up. Nicky had switched to his smooth, uh, dry tires, but they were cold, and he struggled to get them up to temperature. It was a dangerous situation in the section of the track that were still damp. There are tons of trees at the Nürburgring, so there's probably a lot of shady spots that kept it from drying up. And given the length of the Nürburgring, the damp sections were numerous and impossible to get a feel for lap to lap. On a left-handed curve of the track, Nicky came too close to the curb on the inside corner. His left rear tire clipped it, causing the rear tires of his F1 car to skid out right, causing a bit of oversteer. He corrected, but overly so, which sent the car's rear veering wide to the left. So the he he's correcting, he catches the slide, but so then like over snap oversteer. Yeah, so he's uh skidding out until he's at a right angle to the track. He's drifting, his car slams into the, the guardrail, which blocked the cars from flying into the woods. Nikki's car instantly erupts into flames. Parts fly everywhere, and his car slides back onto the track. He's in the middle of the track, his car's on fire, and he's trapped inside of it. Guy Edwards, a driver trailing Nicky, was able to dodge the wreck, but the next car wasn't as lucky. Driver Brett Lunger drove directly into Nicky's flaming Ferrari with a sickening crunch. There was a secondary explosion of leaking fuel. The drivers involved leapt out of their cars and pulled Nicky from the wreckage as the flames and black smoke poured out of the now molten hot Ferrari. I think Nikki was in the car for about a minute. It's not like they could just easily grab Nikki yeah. right away. And they're just, they approach the car. And I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a massive fireball at this point. Uh, so they're, they're not really so sure what to do. They're like calling over safety workers, but of course the, the, the track is so long. So they're, the, the workers aren't able to get there as quickly. It was Hans Stuck driving for the March team whose quick actions may not have saved Nikki's life, but saved him from further agony. As the ambulance approached, he waved for the vehicle to break protocol and drive against traffic towards the site of the accident, saving as much as an hour of time. Whoa. I yeah. think that was the right call. Yeah. Because of his fellow driver's valiant efforts, Nikki was alive, but only barely. Nikki described his memories of his waking moments following the crash, quote, you realize that you are getting weaker and weaker and feel that it would be best to let go of everything, to let yourself fall as if into a deep hole or well. But at the same time, you try to react. You try to do everything you can so you don't die. God, that's brutal. I think that's probably the best. I mean, I've never had a near-death experience, but I think that's the best, best description of death yeah, I've ever I read. I don't, I've never been at that point, but I definitely feel what he's feeling. After he was flown to the hospital, his condition was touch and go. The race had resumed at the Nürburgring and James Hunt had prevailed, but the rivalry seemed like something from a lifetime ago. On his hospital bed, a delirious Nicky Lauda asked a visiting Danielle Odetto, Ferrari's team manager, the keys to his rental car. Out of his mind on drugs, he conducted a phone interview for a Brazilian radio station something that years later he would have no memory of. At the hospital, Nicky was wrapped from head to toe in bandages, his nose and his steely blue eyes now misted over with drugs, the only part of his body visible. Fumes from the melted car had poisoned his lungs. Oh A nurse God. asked him if he wished to receive his last rites, and he said yes, figuring it couldn't do any harm. <laughs> Might as well, uh, just in case, you know. <laughs> Nikki waited in silence before realizing that the priest, figuring he was unconscious, was delivering the prayer in silence. Nikki was upset, but forever <laughs> with a chip on his shoulder, it made him determined to fight on despite the perceived slight. That's so also, funny. <laughs> this guy. Also a comfort was Nikki's wife, Marlena. 
Although Nikki could not speak, she sat by his side and spoke to him for hours. So Nikki talks about, in this interview that I watched, he talks about how the doctors, quote, vacuumed his lungs out. Um, so they would uh, use a little suction hose to, like, get all of, like, the, like, there was just, like, carbon from all the smoke in there that was, like, clogging everything up. There was, like, he said plastic pieces, bits of plastic oh and rubber in his lungs as well. Like, it's a miracle that he survived. Yeah, yeah. it's a miracle that he lived to be 70. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's why you and you're like 70, too young. I was like, that <laughs> the guy made it pretty far, <laughs> considering. Yeah. Fair enough. Hello, comrades. We are in the thick of winter and a storm is brewing. It looks like one to three inches are in the forecast when you trim that hibernation bush that's taking place in your pants. Luckily, our partners at Manscaped specialize in products to make sure you're walking around town with those beautiful snowballs. Manscaped is here to provide the best tools for your grooming experience, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. We've all had that experience where we get just a little bit too close and then we're paying for it for the next week or so. The Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer is the best hygiene tool for the modern man. I use it. And it's because of their ceramic blade advanced skin safe technology your snags on your snowballs will be reduced. The trimmer is also waterproof so you can trim in the shower or jacuzzi or your sauna. And Manscaped's performance package is the best buy of 2021. I know you're saying it's pretty early to call that, but that's what I'm doing. Comes with the Lawnmower 3.0, comes with the Weed Whacker, which is an ear and nose hair trimmer. It comes with performance boxer briefs, which I wear regularly. I love them. Me and Nolan love those briefs. And a travel bag. The travel bag is super convenient. I always take it with me when I travel. You might as well use the best tools for the job. I mean, it's your body. Why would you use anything less than premium Manscaped products? Products on your body. And this bundle also comes with the Crop Preserver, which is ball deodorant, and Crop Reviver, which is ball toner. Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant that will make your balls smell nice and it'll make you feel like your testes are walking in the winter wonderland. And the Crop Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. It's made with soothing aloe and witch hazel extracts. So get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's G-A-S-20. And while you're there, they have a bunch of other cool products for men's hygiene. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com with the code GAS20. Big thanks to Manscaped for making our winter wieners look so good. Thankfully, it soon became clear that Nikki's recovery was headed in the right direction. The doctors attributed it to Nikki's iron will. It also helped that the Austrian had been leading a much healthier lifestyle than the average person of the time. Concerned when he read headlines about Nikki in a coma, a friend called the hospital where Nikki was recovering, only to find a lucid and distinctly uncomatose Nikki happy to chat on the other end of the line. Oh yeah, I'll take the call. <laughs> Once he was able to leave the hospital, Nikki took up residence at a luxury hotel in the Alps to rehabilitate himself with the help of Willy Dungol, an Austrian fitness guru. He took his first press conference, walking into a room of photographers eager to get photos of Nikki's wounds. Still in bandages, and with his upper half of his right ear melted away, Nikki faced the crowd of journalists bravely. The first question was cruel. How did it feel to have such an unnatural face? Oh God. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nikki replied, what's unnatural? It's just a piece of my natural thigh in my face. <laughs> 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 That's so cool. Uh, the next question. What does your beautiful wife Marlena have to say about how you look now? God, shut There's, up. <laughs> there, didn't, there didn't seem to be any empathy for what Nikki had suffered. Nikki left the press conference shocked. He turned to his manager and said, Did you see how crazy they are about my burnt face? From now on, we charge double. <laughs> It was a sardonic type of humor that Nikki would wear as a kind of armor in the decades that followed. When asked by an interviewer how his face looked after the accident, he said, huge and burnt. <laughs> <laughs> and reflected that, while well, I definitely look different than I did before. Some people are born less beautiful than I am now. At least I have an excuse with the accident. Another protective piece of gear would be a ubiquitous baseball hat that he'd wear in nearly every public appearance, partially covering the scar tissue that now covered most of his scalp and forehead. Yeah, in that interview, he uh, said that uh, the cap is like a protection from stupid people 
looking at me <laughs> stupidly is one uh, one way to say it. Uh, the first time he he looked at himself in the mirror, uh, you know, I I think I'd be like, oh, geez, like I'd be despondent probably. Uh, but Nikki, like, I think this part of that like that that steely Austrian stoicism. He was just like, well, like he said to himself, like, and my face is <laughs> <up."> <laughs> like, well, he wasn't he wasn't like super, you know handsome before i feel like he had spent his whole life kind of building up these this defense of you know snark yeah for people who called him ugly or called him a rat or whatever yeah anyway he said to himself well you know what like thank god i'm alive it is what it is and that's just what that's go from there you know of course while nikki's physical recovery was incredible it was the mental component of strapping back into an f1 cockpit that was perhaps even more impressive after missing only two races, six weeks later, Lauda was slated to return at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, like I said, just six weeks after the accident. As much as Brands Hatch was James Hunt's home turf, Monza, House of Ferrari, was the adoptive home of Nicky Lauda. James's first line upon seeing Nicky was, quote, Nicky, you're the only person I know who can come out of fire and look better looking insane other drivers criticized ferrari's decision to hire a third driver for the season forcing nicky to race out of fear that he would lose his spot still carlos rutum nicky's teammate at ferrari was amazed at his recovery saying quote it's very impressive that after such a short time nicky is so fit and keen on driving fit was maybe going a little too far just like at nurburgring uh this race was rainy and a chilling reminder of the last time nicky had been at the track as Nicky sat down behind the wheel for the first time since his accident, he was suddenly emotionally overwhelmed by the events of the four, last four weeks. All of it came flashing back. The sudden and fiery crash at Nürburgring, the weeks spent in a hospital bed, the loss of skin and his ear, the skin transplants, the rehabilitation, and the flash of camera bulbs as the media closed in. He did one slow lap, then went back to the pits. He got out of his car and regrouped. Once he got back in, he decided that he had to race for himself. Having missed two races, Nicky now had to finish and get points in order to stay in contention for the championship. James Hunt and McLaren had once again run into rules trouble, this time for allegedly using, quote, illegal fuel, and had been forced to start at the back of the grid. A frustrated Hunt tried to charge through the pack but spun out, prompting cheers from the Ferrari-backing Italian crowd known as the Tifosi. James's day had ended with jeers from the crowd as he jogged back to the pits. A nervous Marlena watched in the crowd as Nicky raced. Even without his main rival in the race, nerves were high. Incredibly, Nicky placed fourth and was given a standing ovation by the crowd. Upon finishing, he was mobbed by teammates and bystanders who just wanted to congratulate him, not only for staying in contention for the championship, but simply for returning to racing. I mean, a month is like, you're still probably wearing bandages and you're still you've still probably oh, yeah. got you're like still plasma gooey. leaking from your skin his yeah. his wounds had not healed all the way and uh his uh his fire hood uh got Ugh. like soaked with was like soaked yeah. with blood after he uh, got after God. the race yeah all i can think about is how bad your helmet would hurt oh yeah, yeah. ah man. like helmets are uncomfortable anyway the next season turned to north america for the canadian grand prix before that, however, the Formula One Commission met to decide on the British Grand Prix. They ruled that James was indeed disqualified from the British Grand Prix that he had won, causing him to lose all nine points. McLaren lost their sights on the season. James decided to say screw it and party upon landing in Toronto. The entire McLaren team, dejected and probably a little bitter, partied at the hotel bar where a cover band led by a Stevie Nicks lookalike played <laughs> no late way. into the night. That's so sweet. <laughs> Uh, the next morning, James showed up severely hungover. The si the singer at his side. No way, dude. Uh, She's not Stevie, but she'll do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like James Hunt probably could have like slept with the real Stevie Nicks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's just such a sign. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sad. <laughs> yeah, I do this to take my mind off my feelings. <laughs> I'm not emotionally healthy. I've got nice blonde hair, though. <laughs> Can I have a water bottle? <laughs> Can I have a freaking Gatorade or something? <laughs> Maybe a bacon, egg, and cheese. 
<laughs> after his bacon, egg, and cheese, he hit the track and un- unbelievably, <laughs> after the night he had, won the race. Whoa. The unexpected win meant that the championship was still in play for both McLaren and Ferrari. At the next race, the U.S. Grand Prix, Hunt won again, putting him only three points back. It all came down to the 1976 Japanese Grand Prix, the final race of the season. The two drivers were separated by only three points, meaning that winning the race for either competitor would win the season. On race day, a heavy downpour delayed the event. Many of the drivers argued with F1 leadership that the race should be called off. Even James Hunt, who needed a chance at points to win the championship, wanted it to be called off. The delay reached two hours when abruptly the organizers announced the race would start after all, although the rain had not abated. The reason? The race was the first ever to be broadcast on satellite, and the organizers were worried that if they were called off, they would lose daylight, making broadcasting the event impossible. It all came down to money. As the race began, the cars sent up giant plumes of water, reducing visibility for everyone except the lead driver, James Hunt. Rambrilla, the March driver, attempted to pass James but spun out. Nicky, lagging behind, made a momentous decision. Only two laps in, he pulled into the pits. He felt that the conditions made racing safely impossible. In his words, my life is worth more than a title. A shocked Daniel Odetto, the team manager, called seeing terror in Nicky's eyes as he exited the car. He asked Nicky if he wanted to claim a technical failure to save face. Nicky said no. Tells him the truth. It's too dangerous to race. Meanwhile, James Hunt raced on. He had to place third or better to win the championship. As the track dried, McLaren team worried that James's wet weather tires would overheat. They put out a sign for him to purposefully drive through the wetter part of the track on the straightaway, which would help them cool. But James was either oblivious or ignored the team's pleas. With five laps left, James was forced to the pits with not one but two flat tires. He rejoined the race in fifth place, needing to regain two spots. Hunt charged aggressively. Incredibly, he did exactly what he needed to do, placing third and becoming world champion. Amazingly, as the race ended, James was confused and thought that he had come in fourth. He pulled into the pits and began to rage at his team in frustration. They eventually calmed him down enough for him to realize that he was the champion. (laughs) James was magnanimous in victory, saying, I feel sorry for Nicky. I wanted to win the championship, and I felt I deserved to win the championship. I also felt Nicky deserved to win the championship, and I just wish that we could have shared it, you know. Like, tied for first, or both gone out and just gone at the exact same time. <laughs> <laughs> like in Ford versus Ferrari. <laughs> that's a movie that's going to come out in 45 years. That's a movie that's going to come out in 45 years. If you like this movie that I'm currently making. <laughs> <laughs> that was the weirdest part about Rush is when it, it got really meta. He started talking to the camera. He said, hey, I'm Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, check out Thor. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that just shows that like these guys, they're you know, fierce rivals. But, you know, on the field of battle, your biggest enemy can become your biggest friend. We've said it a, a bunch on this show. It's like at a certain point when you're just this elite type of person you know you're just at the top of this mountain the only people that truly understand you and that you truly understand are up on the top of that mountain with you nikki was one of the least photogenic drivers in form i feel like that's a just <laughs> what the <laughs> <laughs> yeah he wasn't good looking so what but ironically he had helped usher in the modern era of f1 as a global television event giving home audiences their first taste of an exciting, season-long F1 rivalry. Without both him and James, F1 would probably not be what it is today. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. After 1976, James Hunt never won a championship again and retired in 1979. From there, he went to broadcast for the BBC, uh, but unfortunately, he died in his sleep of a heart attack in 1993 at age 45. Oh, man, so young. For his part, Nicky proved that his accident at the Nürburgring had barely slowed him down. After all, if he hadn't been forced to miss those two races, it would have been him, not James, who was champion in 1976. It took him only a year to win a second championship at Ferrari, and from there he raced for Brabham, 
And then McLaren. He he took a little hiatus, actually. He took a few years off and then went to McLaren, his former rival. It was, it was then, in 1983, that he won his third world title, prevailing over his teammate, Alan Prost, becoming the only driver to win a championship for both Ferrari and McLaren. And I think it's also worth mentioning that that uh, six-year gap between 77 and 83, like that's not something a lot of champ or a lot of drivers can uh, can claim. That's a pretty big gap. Yeah, there's a lot of like technological advances that happen during that time too. It's like being a TikTok star <laughs> in 2015 and then trying to come back in 2021. You have to relearn all the new dances. Mm-hmm. You do all the new lip syncs. Yeah, you do. Well, it's like very few people are able to make. The transition from Vine to TikTok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he took off three years between 79 and 82. I don't want to be too bold, okay? But I, the only pers- the, the only driver right now who could have a similar sort of uh, comeback like that would be Fernando Alonso, who's coming back this year. I thought you were going to say uh, Grosjean. Grosjean. Grosjean uh, <laughs> is no, he's not in Formula One for the, for the prospective future. Um, but we got... Alonzo coming back this season at Renault. We might see some. I don't know. It'd be it'd be quite the sight. Uh, anyway, even as a champion, Nicky was critical of the hype around Formula One. In his words, quote, I think Formula One is often overrated by the fans who come to the Grand Prix and the media. Formula One should not be this way. It's just the fact that there are 26 more or less crazy drivers going around in circles for their own pleasure. It's given too much significance. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true i love it that's i don't know if i agree but i i love that that's awesome um after formula one nikki said quote i became more human i lost my blinkers and my singular brutal focus on winning a race my view of life became broader i don't think i can completely lose my egotism but i could reduce it to a level where my fellow human beings especially my wife did not have to suffer anymore <laughs> uh, so that's just like exactly what you would imagine a sociopath to say <laughs> like i understand i'm a piece of shit, and i guess now that i'm not on top of the world i can like be a normal person i <laughs> did we mention it in the script but anyway his his ex-wife marlena said in an interview that like nikki was an asshole <laughs> when he was racing yeah um he is, yeah, he's the worst asshole. And he agreed. <laughs> After retiring, Nikki focused on the airline that he had founded in 1979 known as Lada Air. At one point, the airline had as many as 66 planes in its fleet. Nikki had sold his shares in 1999 to Austrian Air, making a rich man even richer. For much of the lifetime of the airline, he was a pilot himself, logging over 13,000 hours in the sky. He also... Oh. Uh, had his own. He still had a private jet, a Bombardier, that he would fly to races in himself. He didn't want to rely on airlines. Even as he managed an airline and worked as a pilot, Nikki also agreed to management roles on various F1 teams. And in 2012, Lauda would make his mark uh, as a non-executive chairman for the Mercedes-AMG Patronus team. He was part of the negotiations to sign Lewis Hamilton to his initial three-year contract with the team the beginning of a relationship that spawned the most successful dynasty in F1 history. On May 20th, 2019, Nicky Lauda passed away at age 70 from complications related to his kidneys. To honor him, Mercedes painted their halo red with writing that read, Nicky, we miss you. His funeral was attended by Lewis Hamilton, Alan Prost, Jackie Stewart, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and a host of other dignitaries from the F1 community and beyond. It was always a joy to see uh, Nikki get, like, interviewed after Lewis won. Yeah, Uh, that was a really fun fun. part of seeing that team operate. And at the, uh, I think it was 2019, Monaco Grand Prix, like, everyone everyone was wearing, like, a red hat that said Nikki on it. Yeah, and then there was, like, the ceremony at the end where they all just, like, touched the hat on the pedestal. Yeah, that was cool. He had one of his red helmets from his McLaren days. Super cool. Part of the appeal of driving cars and racing is the chance to transcend your human body. When you're behind the wheel of a massive vehicle, you feel like you're more than just flesh and bone. You gain the illusion that you're one with the car, part machine, that the wheels and the engine are an extension of your body. But that's just an illusion. Our human bodies are impossibly fragile and soft compared to the cars we drive. Whenever there's a big crash, 
like Romain Grosjean's dramatic near-death experience this past year in Bahrain, we're jolted out of our reverie and giving a shocking reminder of just how vulnerable we all are. Nicky Lauda was a man who almost died, but lived. And he spent his second shot at life doing what he loved. That's what we should all be doing every day. Hopefully it's a lesson that doesn't take a fiery crash to learn. Wow. I, dude, I've got such like a, like I said, I always love seeing Nikki Lauda's interviews um, after races, but like now I've got like such a, just a, a, a refreshed appreciation for the man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great story. He's a, he's super intelligent and just like self-aware. And even though he was an asshole, like that's kind of how you have to be to be like, a three-time world champ. You just have to mm-hmm. kind of disregard your emotions and, you know, be the <laughs> asshole, be be the heel. But he was also hilarious. Yeah. He had really fun comebacks and yeah. kind of poke fun at himself a lot. And I think that's really cool. Well, I think like, you know, it's e- especially because like his rivalry was with someone like James Hunt. I think like it's easy to present someone in like like we said before like a very black and white sort of one-dimensional way because that serves the story it's like james hunt is super charming and nikki loud is like this like ice man asshole. you know yeah. it's 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 a little bit like snake and mongoose where you know it's like no nikki was funny too yeah and nikki was charming too you know he it was easy to hate him because he had like a hateable accent and he was kind of had i think he had fun with his character a little bit yeah you leaned into it yeah, that's the lesson, man. Lean into it. Lean into it. If people call you a prick, just be a fucking <laughs> no. prick. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to Pascal's. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. Go ahead and tell someone about the podcast. Let them know that you don't have to be a fan of cars to like this show. You know, that's what it's all about. Buy this new shirt. <laughs> Pop up headlight shirt. Pop up headlight shirt now available at donutmedia.com. Follow Nolan on social media. That's Twitter and Instagram at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut at Donut Media. Thank you to our writer, Thomas Boulette, and our producer, Bridget. Couldn't do the show without, Keep it juiced. without the team. Keep it juiced. Be kind. I love you. See you next time. <laughs> All right.